So when you think of Utah agriculture, you probably don't think of corn, right? Um, according to the United States Department of Agriculture's um, National Agricultural Statistics Service, the top three corn producing states are Iowa, Illinois, and Nebraska. And Utah falls into 41st place. So we don't produce that much by comparison. But nevertheless, field and sweet corn still has a prevalence in our state's small but mighty agricultural industry. So this can include agrotourism, like corn mazes. I personally love corn mazes. Um, a lot of it goes towards livestock feed. So that includes the actual grain of the corn and the silage. And then of course, human consumption, which I'm sure most of you guys grow sweet corn for. So when I was putting together this presentation, I thought about all the pests that we see in Utah sweet corn production. And really there's three that I commonly see and that a lot of people I work with see. And this includes sap beetles, the corn earworms, and then of course the European earwigs. The other ones I listed here, I would classify as uncommon or even rare. So I know most of you guys are home gardeners, so I'll focus the management tactics on what's practical for a small scale. If you do have a large commercial operation, you can feel free to reach out to me after and I'll give you some of our recommendation op um, options for the large field producers out there. So let's get started. So sap beetles, this is the first one I wanna talk about. Sap beetles are small dark beetles in the Natuidae family. They are attracted to sweet substances and food order, odors. They can be a significant nuisance at food processing plants, roadside fruit and vegetable stands, or basically anywhere where food is kept uncovered outdoors. They often attack close to harvest and are found in crops that have pre-existing feeding damage from other insect pests. So corn is actually one of the main economically important hosts for these sap beetles. Generally, they are a secondary pest, but they can become a high primary, primary pest, especially if their populations are high. And I've definitely seen high populations of sap beetles in sweet corn. And they often, um, the adult beetles like pictured here will feed on the silks of the corn, the pollen and the tassels too. And then the larva like shown in this picture feed on the kernels inside the husk. So the larva may even hollow out the kernels in the upper half of the ear. So here's a photo where there's some really extensive sap beetle damage. And this is a photo I just took last year. So how do we manage them? Well, for sap beetles, if you deem them to be a big problem, you can set up these bait and pheromone traps. And that'll allow you to both monitor and control the numbers. And you can use these traps with like a sugary substance that will attract them, or even like you can purchase baits for the sap beetles. Um, another thing is field sanitation. This will help keep the beetle numbers down. Sap beetles are attracted to fermented plant juices and damaged corn plants. So do not let your corn become overripe and start to rot in the field. And you wanna remove the damage and overripe corn as quickly as you want, quickly as you can from the field. You don't wanna leave a lot of um, piles of corn or other fruits in your field either. If possible, avoid planting near fruit or vegetable dump sites, um, especially compost areas, because so, sap beetles love composting areas as well. And preventing damage from other pests will also prevent the damage from the sap beetles. So remember, the sap beetles are secondary pests, so they'll come in after other insects have caused their feeding. So they also have resistant varieties of sweet corn. And what makes them resistant is they'll grow tighter husk. So that'll make it difficult for sap beetles and other insect pests to get into the actual ears of the corn. And at the end of the season, or even kind of mid-season, you can kind of disc or plow in the soil 
where that overwintering, or sorry, not overwintering, but pupation stage occurs. Um, sap beetles are typically late season and post-harvest pests. So we usually don't recommend chemical control because by the time you see them, it's already harvest time. So it's not necessary. So the next one I'm gonna talk about that you guys are probably familiar with and probably have seen is the corn earworms. Corn earworm is one of the most destructive insect pests of sweet corn in Utah. It can also attack um, our peppers and tomatoes. So another name for it is a tomato fruit worm, which you might've heard of. The adult is a tan brown moth that is most active at dusk. And then the moths can be carried in wind currents and can travel up to 300 miles in one night. So they're pretty migratory. Um, the corn earwig, it'll overwinter in the pupa stage, and this actually happens in central and southern Utah, and then it'll immigrate to the northern parts of the state in the springtime. So the direct damage to the ear on the tips of the kernels is caused by this larva stage. So this can include damage to the silk that can decrease the pollination, leading to a poor, a poor ear fill on your kernels. Corn earworm frass can also be left behind from feeding. Feeding, so remember that's the insect poop. So that can reduce the quality, storage life, and just the marketability of the sweet corn. And this can also allow for the increase of mold growth within the ear. And those sap beetles we talked about earlier, they can often come in after the corn earworm does its feeding. So how can we manage it? Well, you can plant resistant corn varieties. So like we talked about with the sap beetles, um, varieties like, I wrote some down, Country Gentleman, Stay Gold, Golden Security. Those are some varieties that grow really tight husk. So those can help prevent the corn earworms. You can plant some corn crops early. Um, so that could, they'll go to silk before the major moth activity can come and they can escape the injury. Um, one option, especially if you just have a few plants in your garden, is you can use clothespins. So clothespins, if you put them at the point where the silk enters the ear, this can help keep the worms out of the ear. But this should be done soon after the first silk emerges. And then they'll leave the pins in place until the ear has filled and is ready for harvest. So that's kind of a cool technique. Um, in the fall, you can till your soil because remember the pupa stage is gonna overwinter in the soil. So if you're tilling and disrupting that soil, that'll kill off that overwintering pupa stage. So the next one that I'm sure you guys are familiar with is the European earwig. And I won't, don't even have to describe it that much because I'm sure you guys have all seen it. There are these kind of brown insects are about, they can get pretty big. I would say like half an inch to one inch long and they have these notable pinchers that we call Circe, and they have these long antennas. And the thing about earwigs is they like dark, tight, moist spaces. So I listed them here in sweet corn is because almost every season, if I'm walking through fields or gardens, I find them in the husks of the plant. So they like to burrow in kind of into the leaves and they'll leaf frass, they'll do a lot of feeding damage and they'll even eat like some of the kernels and silk. So if there's enough earwigs, they can be pretty problematic for our sweet corn production. So here's another picture I took um, a couple summers ago where the earwigs have just completely chewed off all the silk. So obviously this corn isn't going to get pollinated and produce you can just kind of see some of the frass and other chewing damage that the earwigs did. So the best way to manage earwigs is one of my favorites that I always recommend for small growers is those bait traps. So you can use like a tuna can, a yogurt, or it's empty sour cream contain container. And you can bury that into the soil. And then for the bait, you can use like a smelly oil. So like I've used canola oil, you can use fish oil, clam oil, bacon grease, anything that's really stinky and attractive to those earwigs. And at night when they're most active, they'll come to that bait and they'll fall in and get stuck. So every couple of days you can replenish and replace those traps to really stay on top of your ear, earwig populations. 
And another thing to do is to get rid of any nesting places. So remember I said they like kind of those dark kind of tight covered spots. So if you have like a lot of plant debris around, they might be underneath there. They also might be like under weed barriers. So those are just kind of places you wanna get rid of to prevent the earwigs from making a home there. So the next one I wanna talk about is damping off. So if you guys are probably familiar with this term, this is just kind of a general term that we describe for like different root rots that occur early in the season. So typically a lot of people might see this if they're starting stuff by seeds inside their homes or in a greenhouse. And basically, as soon as the plant germinates, it'll shrivel up kind of at the base of the stem and just die off. So this can be caused by a variety of soil-borne pathogens like Pythium, Pythothera, Rhizocotonia, and Fusarium. And again, it mostly happens in an indoor seed starting setting, but sometimes in the field, if there's high enough soil-borne um, funguses or fungi present, and there's a lot of moisture from irrigation or standing water that will allow for those soil-borne fungi, fungal spores to move, that can really increase your instances of damping off. So here's kind of a photo where you can see this corn plant starting to die off. It's just a lot smaller and weaker compared to some of the others. And then of course, here's a close-up image. And then here's one where you can see the root is just, or not the root, the stem and the roots are just really shriveled, like that vascular tissue has died off. And really what I recommend is, because most of us plant our corn from seed directly into the soil outside, right? So you can avoid this just by avoiding excessive irrigation, especially when you first plant your seeds. And, but you don't wanna keep the soil too dry or sit in the water for days. So just really good proper irrigation can prevent damping off. So the next one I wanna to talk to you guys about is the Western corn rootworm. So adults are these small beetles with yellow green bodies and they have kind of these blurred three black, black stripes on their forewings. And then the larvae are creamy colored, they're white and they have these brown red colored head capsules. So the Western corn and rootworms are active early June to mid July. So when you guys are out looking at your sweet corn, now it's time to kind of be looking for them. Um, in Utah, we have one generation per year. They overwinter as eggs in the soil. And you can monitor for them on your corn, like I said, about now. And then the larva, this is what the damaging, the main damaging stage is. I've seen both the adult and larva do damage in Utah, but typically in most corn regions, the larva is what does damage. So they will feed on the roots and that causes these browning lesions and tunneling and that'll curve the corn stalks. So here's a picture of a healthy corn root. And here's one where the corn root larva did some damage. And then these plants where they're kind of bent over, this is caused by that feeding damage. So how we manage this is through crop rotation. So again, this is more effective if you have a larger site. So if you had corn in one field and it's had that problem, you don't wanna plant corn again there because then all those overwintering pests are already gonna be present, ready for the next season. But if you put it in a spot where there wasn't corn last year, there's not gonna be those overwintering corn pests, right? So that's just kind of a general rule that we use for a lot of our crops. So other managements include planting early, similar with that um, corn earworm. So corn becomes less attractive to the adults after the pollen shed has happened. So planting early may help disrupt the timing of adult emergence with corn silking. And then early planted fields also have stronger root systems that might become more tolerant to the larval feeding. Um, 
So they are, they do have seed treatments. So corn seeds treated with like an insecticide can help reduce some light to moderate corn rootworm feeding pressure. And then if you do see adults and you feel like the damage is severe enough, there are insecticide options that you can spray for the adults. But again, in Utah, like we have pretty minimal corn production that we usually don't recommend um, chemical treating. And even like home gardeners, like the corn or the Western corn rootworm, it's pretty rare, I would say. But if you have seen this in your home garden settings, I would be interested to know. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is armyworms and cutworms. So armyworms and cutworms, they can be found all over the United States with various species found in Utah. Um, some of the most common ones that I've personally seen is the fall armyworm, the black cutworm, and then the western bean cutworm. So here's a picture of those. So here's the fall armyworm, the western bean cutworm, and the black cutworm. So these insects, they belong to a large group of night flying moths in the family Noctuidae. Um, so they're just kind of like these basic brown looking moths. I used to call them Miller moths. Um, Army worms and cutworms, they can ca cause serious damage, especially when there's like outbreaks. So every year we'll have a few sporadic um, Army worms and cutworms, but every couple years we might see kind of a big outbreak where the overwintering conditions were perfect and a lot of them survive. So I've seen that once um, in my time in Utah where there's been just whole fields infested with army worms. So here's what some of the eggs look like. They're really tiny, you can see compared to a pencil and they're usually laid on the leaves of the corn. So to manage them, if you, or I guess here's some pictures of the damage I'll talk about. So the larva, they can do a lot of foliar feeding. So you can see here, they just chomped all the way through some of these leaves. And then the cutworms, they get their name because they'll literally cut the plant off, especially when they're small and young like this. So they can be a serious problem. So if you have kind of a large field or a large plot of sweet corn, you might benefit from using a pheromone trap. That'll allow you to capture the adults and monitor their populations. Um, make sure you're out checking your corn frequently for any feeding damage like this and look for those egg masses on the foliage like we've seen. And then you want to, of course, check multiple times in all your fields or plots. And then, of course, manage weeds because weeds can serve as an alternate host for not only cutworms, armyworms, but a lot of pests. And then, of course, avoid planting in fields that have a bad history of worm problems. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is horn smut. So I'm sure you guys um, are familiar with this. This is pretty rare in Utah. There's only one place down in Sandy that I've seen it consistently every year. But um, it's usually a concern when plants become affected early in the growing season um, because it'll grow on the growing points of the corn and it overwinters at spores in the soil or on infected corn debris. In the late spring, wind born or wind, um, wind blown or rain splash spores can cause infections on the succulent tissue. And then as these galls age, they'll erupt and then they'll spread to other parts. So here's kind of a cool microscope, oops, microscope picture of the spore. So again, these white fleshy galls, they'll form on the tassels, the corn kernels, the leaves, shoots, pretty much all parts of the plants. And in some cultures, they actually consume these galls. So of course, I wouldn't recommend eating fungi unless you're really familiar with it, but that's sometimes people intentionally grow these. So this disease is very, very rare in Utah. So if you find it, I would recommend just breaking it off and removing it. It's not really worth the time or money to manage it just because it is so rare and it doesn't cause too much damage. Okay, so the next one we're gonna talk about is the corn leaf aphid. 
So the corn leaf aphid, it overwinters um, in the adult stage in warmer and more southern areas, especially within Utah. And then again, in the springtime, they'll move farther north to our population centers. Um, they can fly or they're carried in the wind currents. Um, the winged aphids, they'll fly in search of suitable hosts, which can include also, besides corn, it can include barley, sorghum, and other grass. Because remember, corn is technically grass. So a lot of these alternate hosts are grass species. So typically, I personally only see the corn leaf, leaf aphids at like harvest time or if people have left their corn out in their gardens way too long. That's usually when I see it. So it's not really a pest like actively during the growing season. So it's typically not too much of a concern. But if you do want to avoid it, you can plant early. Um, and the control is most effective two to three weeks prior to tasseling. But again, it's very rarely observed during that period. And if you do see it, um, like with all other aphids, we just recommend spraying it with a strong stream of water or spraying it with like horticultural oils that can help take care of these corn leaf aphids. So here's some photos that I took where, again, this was like way, this was like in August. So the corn was well overripe um, and this, the aphids came in and were causing some aesthetic damage. Nothing too serious on like the corn cobs themselves. Okay, so next is the seed corn maggot. So this is kind of an interesting one because the adult is actually a fly. And what the actual pest is, is the larval stage or the maggots, we call them. So damaged plants usually show like wilting um, or reduced growth. And then there will be lighter green parts of the plant. And then the seedlings that are young, they'll probably die off. The most vulnerable healthy plants can tolerate some infestation. So again, if you plant your seeds um, in early in the season and it's, there's a lot of moisture and a lot of organic matter in your soil, that's going to really attract um, the flies to lay their eggs there. So that could really kill back some of your corn seeds that you plant. So to manage, you need to obviously handle your seeds very carefully. If there's any like cracks or um, breakage in them, that'll attract the larva. Um, again, you can rotate crops for like the same reasons before. The overwintering pupa stage is already be in that soil. Um, I've seen a lot of people in Utah use the raised beds to grow their sweet corn and raised beds are pretty helpful in pest control in general just because you have a lot more control over the soil and you're tilling it more often. And then of course, immediately after harvest, you wanna destroy or disc underneath the crop residue. So that, again, that'll get rid of that overwintering stage because maggots can survive for an extended amount of time in crop residue and, and in the soil. And when several rows of your seedlings are infested then you might just have to completely replant so hopefully that <laughs> hasn't happened to you. Okay, so next I wanna talk about was the wheat mosaic virus. So again, this is kind of a rare one. Um, the symptoms really depend on the variety of corn and the time the in infection happens. And really the main symptom we see is some stunting of the foliage, or sorry, stunting of the growth and mosaic patterns of the foliage. So this can include like these yellow stripes up and down, they're about an inch wide and they'll can be observed on the leaves and then infected plants, they'll become more symptomatic as time goes on. Um, and I should say the only time we've really seen this is in large commercial fields. So rarely we see it in our like home sweet corn production. And it's actually spread by a little insect called the wheat curl mite. And again, we don't see that a lot in like home or urban production. That's usually more out in rural areas. But it can also be transmitted by the seed, corn seed. So if you are sourcing corn seed, you wanna make sure it's healthy and disease free. So if you do see it 
honestly, you might have had it and not even noticed because it's again, it's just really subtle virus and it doesn't really do much to the corn cob itself. So for management, I personally wouldn't recommend too much for the home grower. So the last one I want to talk about, again, they call it common rust, but it's pretty rare in Utah. Um, it can appear as these oval, elongate, kind of brown pustules that are scattered on the upper leaves, upper surfaces of the leaves. So here's a close-up image. And then here's an image of it occurring kind of on the stalk. And then as these pustules mature, they'll turn brown, black, and they'll release these dark brown overwintering spores that we call telospores. So again, to manage this, if by some miracle you come across rust in your sweet corn, you can just treat, there are some fungicide options. So if you do get to that point, you can reach out to me and I can recommend some good fungicides. Otherwise, they do sell varieties of sweet corn that are already resistant to rust. But again, I just want to stress that this is not common in Utah. You probably shouldn't see it. 